Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able and On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Laura Seiler. On this edition, we've, we will focus on housing and people with special needs. With us to discuss um, that and so much more around housing and special needs is um, Ableton On Air's partner uh, in our program, uh, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, uh, Executive Director um, Zachary, Ralph, Z Zachary Ralph Watson. Welcome to Able Then On It. Thank you, Larry. Thanks and, for having um, me. So let's discuss um, housing and people with special needs. First, before we do that, I know you've been on the show numerous times. Um, what are the missions and goals of Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity? Well, again, thanks for having me, Larry. Our uh, Habitat for Humanity is an international organization. Uh, we're in 70 different countries and all 50 states in the United States. And uh, we have a vision of creating a world where everybody has a decent place to live. Uh, we're a Christian, ecumenical, uh, nonprofit, affordable housing organization. And we, um, we focus on home ownership. So we build uh, houses using volunteer labor, donated materials, and, and fundraising uh, to build uh, affordable housing um, for income sensitive Vermonters in central Vermont. And uh, the homeowners um, get a mortgage for their home, and their payments go to support constructing new houses for, um, for other folks that are in need of housing. OK. Uh, talking about people with special needs uh, and housing, uh, what is your opinion about um, the housing situation? Because as of June 1st, um, you know, we're in central Vermont, but as of June 1st, um, the COVID relief package or COVID relief uh, for people that are in hotels, let's talk about that and how is that going to affect um, people in need of housing? Yeah, I think the, um, so we received a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime sort of influx in, of cash during, uh, during the COVID pandemic um, uh, to address the homelessness needs in our state. And Vermont uh, responded with that funding to put uh, homeless populations or the unhoused into hotels and motels across the state. And that program has been ongoing since 2020, I believe. Um, and uh, so the biggest impact of the end of the COVID pandemic and uh, running out of the funds from 
um, the federal relief is that our uh, there is no longer funds to support the homeless voucher hotel voucher program for the homeless and there are currently about 1800 families in Vermont that will become unhoused uh, so they will um, uh, be kicked out of the homes, uh, the hotels and motels, essentially, and so it yeah. it won't, uh, it won't be, um, there won't be any more funding whatsoever, or they won't, at the last minute, try to, is there a last minute, try to not make people unhoused in terms of this? There is, uh, so the. The Vermont Legislature um, passed their their budget, their fiscal year twenty their um, the twenty twenty four budget, and it did not include uh, funding to continue the program. Um, so, uh, if that budget goes through, then there will not be any funds uh, to support no last minute deals uh, to continue the program. Uh, essentially, the uh, unhoused populations will depend on because the winter months are kind of brutal. They are, yeah. They'll uh, have to depend on the Agency of Human Services and DCF and other Department of uh, Services, um, which are already overwhelmed and um, don't have resources to to handle the influx. Uh, the Vermont General Assembly, um, when the budget was passed. Uh, there was uh, the House of Representatives was 10 votes short of getting a supermajority, mm -hmm. which means that if the governor vetoes the budget, then the House would potentially not be able to override his veto. And the legislators that uh, did not vote in favor of, uh, in particular the Democrats that did not, and progressives that did not vote in favor of the budget did so because it did not include funding. Um, to continue the homelessness voucher program. So presumably, if the budget is not, if the veto is not, if the governor vetoes it and it is not overwritten, um, then the House and the, and the Senate will have to come up with a plan uh, to continue, continue or come up with a solution for the homeless population in Vermont. You know, talking about housing for everyone, recently they passed uh, the Senate passed S-100. Explain a little bit about that in detail and what that is in this case when it comes to housing. Yeah, I, I'm, so it, it's, uh, it's a really, it's a very comprehensive housing bill. There's a lot of different pieces in it and it a, attempts to address a lot of the housing um, challenges in Vermont that have sort of held, held us back from being able to build more housing over the last, you know, 100 years really, or, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 80 years, I would say. Um, and uh, so the, the, the reason this is coming about is Vermont is experiencing a housing crisis and where there is not an emergency crisis. It's, uh, it's a, uh, there's an emergency crisis and then there's uh, for our homeless populations, which is it needs to be addressed now. Um, but Vermont um, arguably has been experiencing a housing crisis for a long time. Can you explain more about that? Uh, it really just means that there's um, there's a really low percentage of vacant housing, so uh, the number of housing on the market which is available for purchase, um, and what that does is it drives up the cost of housing for rentals and for purchasing, um, so that it's no longer affordable for working working Vermonters, um, and even people that want to move here to work are na not able to find housing. Um, and so rents are really expensive, and uh, it's really expensive to buy a house. When you say challenges that Vermont's, Vermont is facing, for example, certain buildings, uh, like for example, when we were filming your Barry um, house, um, the house was old, um, or should I use the word grandfathered? Or, I mean, what do you do in that case if you're building or rebuilding someone's house? How do you save um, some of the things that need to be saved? Um, is grandfathering a problem with um, some things in terms of housing, in terms of where to put people, especially people with disabilities? Right, so we would call it, we rehabbed that house, we yeah. rehabilitated it, um, and uh, lots of challenging uh, challenges with rehabilitation. Vermont has some of the oldest housing stock in the country, 
Um, it's, uh, I hope that wasn't a bad question. Nope, not a bad question at all. Um, no, it's one of our challenges um, for the existing housing stock. So um, we do have housing that's considered affordable on the market for low and middle income Vermonters. Um, but typically, these housing units require massive amounts of um, work. Uh, you know, they need well, new rehab, roofs. Yeah. Rehab, exactly. They need new, new roofs, new foundations. They have lead, they have asbestos. Um, and so somebody that is low income that might be able to afford to buy the house at its mortgage value won't necessarily be able to uh, afford the repairs that are required to make it modern, livable, and even insurable. And if you can't insure a house that is mortgaged, then your bank will foreclose on you. So um, that's one of the challenging challenges with the existing housing stock um, is that it's old and it's hard to fix up. So. Um, the you know the, the challenges are what I just talked about. There, um, you know, you run into lead, you run, in, run into asbestos, but also because environmentally, that's not safe. Environmentally, it's uh, it's a health hazard, um, but also for the environment, uh, a lot of these older houses are not um, energy efficient, so they're really expensive to heat and maintain. Um, and so, if you want to bring them to modern energy efficiency standards, uh, then it's going to be very expensive as well. And and if you don't do that, then you're going to be basically depending on fossil fuels, which are uh, very expensive and, and very volatile in their prices. And, um, and then it's just going to be expensive to, to heat and cool your home. Is it, in terms of accessibility and your agency, in terms of, um, let's say, a person with a special need needs um, in a, not well, maybe not a completely accessible home, but some accessibility features. Is it more money to put in for an accessibility feature in somebody's home? Like, is that some of the challenges that people are facing now? Or, um, so ADA compliancy in the house? Um, for newer construction, you know, there is a cost associated with it. You need wider, wider doorways. You need um, structural pull bars in bathrooms. Um, you, the, uh, there either needs to be a ramp that is, uh, you know, is only goes up one foot uh, over, you know, it has to be ADA compliant. Uh, those things can all be expensive. Um, typically for new builds, if you're able to keep it one story, um, and you're, you know, it, it's, it's cheaper with a new build. For a rehab, it uh, becomes, it either is not possible um, or it's, uh, it can be expensive. But yeah, they're uh, to meet uh, ADA accessible what standards. What are some of the other big challenges that people face with um, housing, especially when trying to find it? Um, so the 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 S one hundred the the housing bill um, again there's a it's trying to address a number of challenges that have prevented uh, development across the state and um, one of them is density so that's the number of Explain what that means. it's the number of units that you can build in a certain area um, so uh, the bill makes it so that wherever a single unit building is allowed. Um, it it uh, you it enables that municipality or that that developer to build two units. So it's immediately doubling the capacity of our or the density of our communities. It also makes it so that any uh, the density allowable density for any acre within certain designated areas has to be at least five units. Um, and in some cases, areas with municipal uh, sewer and water can, um, where there's uh, two units are allowed, they can build four. So um, it's cr increasing the number of units that we can build in an area so we have denser downtowns. So that's, that's one piece that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, um, <clears throat> is around some of the, with, with Act 250, uh, which has been enormously successful in conserving our state and our environment, um, but has had some, uh, has not been particularly helpful in areas where we do want to develop, like in our downtown areas, mm -hmm. um, where uh, so it does create some it does create some exemptions um, in Act 250 that allow for ha larger housing developments in designated areas, um, and then it also limits the appeals process. 
um, so that uh, currently you can appeal a development based on its character, um, which is sort of a loosely defined term, but has um, has been sort of a rallying call for the not in my backyarder is, is sort of a catch all. We just I know don't we spoke about that. Last right, time. we don't we don't like this, so it doesn't match the character of the neighborhood. Um, so the is bill it the house or the people that move in. The, it's the house. So they say, okay, it's two stories instead of one. That doesn't match the character. Or it has a pitch roof instead of a flat roof. It doesn't meet the character. Or we just don't like the color. That doesn't. It's, it's, it can be a sort of a catch-all phrase. Because, so that, because years ago, they had a, a thing, you know, not in my backyard example. If I know Vermont doesn't have uh, group homes or as many, but some areas... Uh, don't like certain populations moving in, but that's way in the past. Now we're in the future. So now it all has to do with the building structures itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in areas, in developments that include affordable housing, you cannot use character of the neighborhood as an appeal in the cases of Act 250. So that, that will, um, that takes some of the uncertainty out of developments and it, um, it can be really helpful. But you are correct that um, density requirements, character of the neighborhood, some of these zoning restrictions that have been put in place um, were you know, put in place as a way to keep lower income uh, uh, housing out of certain neighborhoods or in some cases to keep um, uh, traditionally marginalized black, black and indigenous communities out of uh, their 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 areas well, as well. Not people with disabilities. I mean, sometimes it might trickle into that. Uh, yeah, so. I'm not I'm not specifically aware of that, but it's possible. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about let's piggyback. Uh, President Carter created Habitat for Humanity. Um, Jimmy Carter um, was a volunteer with volunteer, Habitat for ha Humanity, but it was a volunteer, uh, and, um, uh, yeah. or he worked to make Habitat for Humanity uh, better. Um, explain a little bit more how, um, for those that really don't know, how Habitat for Humanity uh, really works. So take us, if, if someone wants a house, how do they go about um, doing that, and, and let's start there. Well, uh, um, I want to. I'll kind of connect it to the broader conversation about um, the housing crisis that we started on, right? Sorry. Um, so we we talked about home. Uh, we talked about homeless pop populations a little bit, um, but even um, populations that are in rental housing that is subsidized, yes. um, like Section Eight vouchers uh, yes. through the Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, you know, we have something called a benefits cliff, uh, which is if you make too much money, you lose all your benefits. Um, and but there's also a, a housing cliff in some, in, uh, or I guess you could call it a housing cliff, which is uh, you're in a rental unit and you want to, you've expressed and you have the ability to afford a home, but there's nothing out on the market which you can afford, and so as a result, you are s perpetually stuck in your rental units, which means you're never accumulating wealth, you're never building your financial assets, and therefore you cannot get out of poverty. Um, so our, our housing pipeline is broken because there are none of those affordable housing uh, options for home ownership for folks to get out of the rental world. The only organization in the state that is building your single affordable home is Habitat for Humanity. And so what we do is we partner with people that are in need of housing. So they live in subsidized housing currently. Uh, their existing housing is, uh, doesn't have enough bedrooms. The rent is too much. They live in an unsafe neighborhood. There's mold, asbestos. Their appliances don't work. Those are examples of people that we partner with. Uh, they have to earn less than 80% of the area median income based on their family size or household size. Uh, and we do partner with individuals with that typically for a family of four is somewhere around sixty-eight or $70,000. Um, and uh, so you have to live and or work in Washington in Orange County, uh, and that's an important part of um, having a community. And then the fourth requirement, and this is the most important, is that you have to be willing to partner with us. Uh, and that means that um, you spend up to 250 hours. I think that breaks down to three or four hours a week uh, helping to build your home. So you're there uh, alongside the other volunteers building your home. Um, so we have a we have a application process. People can 
um, sign up to receive notifications when our application process opens um, at our website, centralvermonthabitat.org. Um, but I do want to say a lot of people think that we build houses for poor people, um, and that's not necessarily true. Um, a lot of people in Vermont qualify for our program. Um, some, like a lot of them just don't know about, and they just don't know. Like I said, you know, if you and your partner, if you have, you, if you and your two kids, and your partner earn less than seventy thousand dollars a year, you qualify for our program. That's a lot of Vermonters, um, and uh, so a lot of people think that you know we just partner with poor people. That's that's not the case. We um, we partner with a lot of people who have the means and potentially could afford a home, but there's just nothing out there that they can afford. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you said, let's piggyback, you said housing cliff. Mm -hmm. So let's, okay, like people that are on Social Security, Social Security Disability, Social Security, and other federal programs, is that what you mean by the housing, what exactly do you mean by the housing cliff? Well, so benefits cliff um, is, is a, it's basically you receive Social Security, you receive unemployment, or you receive um, uh, heating fuel assistance, um, things like this. And some of those are not good examples, but heating assistance is a good one. Um, or food stamps, right? These things are uh, help you in your daily activities to afford uh, to, to, to do things. Well, at a certain point, you earn too much money and you lose all that these benefits. But the money that you make actually isn't enough to cover what these subsidies provided before. So you no longer can afford fuel. So you no longer can afford f food. Um, and so there is a there is actually incentive built into that for people to not make more money, unless it's a lot more money. Because if you make more money, then you can't actually afford to live. So that's that's the benefits cliff, <clears throat> and it's that is a state-sponsored system that incentivizes people to stay poor, um, and it's uh, again that's a broken system. The housing cliff I was talking about is uh, something I just made up right now, um, but that's where where you you just you're stuck in subsidized rentals, um, and if you make more money, you, you might lose your subsidized rental, and then you can't afford to live anywhere. And there's no way to get out of that into a housing situation, which would also help you get out of um, subsidized rentals. No. Is there a main reason why there isn't just there isn't enough subsidized rentals or enough housing to go around? I mean, because I, I'm I'm worried to hear about what's going to happen to all those people that are being literally thrown out and they're going to have no place to go. Yeah. I mean, the weather is nice, but <clears throat> with, I mean, what's really going to happen to these people? Uh, is it, it, and the organizations such as Good Samaritan and such as, uh, they're going to be swamped. So what's, what, what, uh, can we, you want to piggyback off that? Um. Yeah, I think the legislature hopes that they will figure it out. Um, they hope that the existing systems will support them. Um, and, uh, and I think most people can agree that that's not the case, that our, that our system is already pretty taxed. It's pretty overwhelmed. And an influx of another 3,000 people into that system is, uh, is going to be very expensive, and it's going to uh, overwhelm our system. Um, so what, in some cases, people who are struggling, um, you know, there's lots of diverse reasons for homelessness. Um, some of it is mental health, some of it is drug and alcohol, some of it is you just can't afford to live somewhere. You've got two functional adults with, with jobs. Um, but people who are um, dealing with mental health or drug addiction problems and maybe have found some stability through the motel voucher system and are able to make progress on, on addressing their addiction, who are then all of a sudden thrown into the streets, mm -hmm. um, where I believe we will, I mean, this is I, all hypotheticals, but I believe we will see more overdoses. I believe we will see more suicides, and because I believe New York, well, other states such as New York, they're having a migrant issue um, now, and they're putting <clears throat> immigrants in that come on buses. They're putting them in hotels, but there's not enough space. Mm -hmm. So, and this is all across the country. 
So now we just have to figure out where to put these folks, you know. Yeah, and, and there's... Um I mean, there's no place to put them. That's, uh, you know, our the in Montpelier we we have an overnight shelter in the winter time, um, that that is sort of. Hope I'm not asking bad questions. No, no, not at all. It's uh, we're dispersed in the different churches, and um, and you know they are pretty close to full capacity right throughout the winter time. Maybe there's room for five or ten more, um, but that's not nearly going to be able to cover the number of people that are coming out of the hotel voucher program um, but the other you know are, are as you know as I said people potentially getting you know becoming unstable with their d drugs uh, might end up uh, incarcerated which of course is very expensive uh, so our prisons might be um, might be a place that uh, that the homeless people end up because they've bec they've been forced out of their hotel situations it's Nothing good is going to come out of um, this, uh, and because we don't have a system that can handle it. If we did, we wouldn't be in this circumstance, so there has to be um, a statewide institutional um, way to address it. Um, so since we have some time left, uh, let's uh, go into, so there's an ap application process for Habitat for Humanity. How can people, uh, what, types of information do they need to fill out those applications? Uh, the initial application is, um, you know, we ask for your income, your expenses. Uh, that helps us determine, uh, you know, gets a, give us a sense of what, um, whether you would f qualify for our program in terms of your ability to pay an affordable mortgage. We do ask for a description of your current housing needs your address. Um, it's just a paper application. It's, I think it's about seven pages, but it's, you don't need any information to fill it out. Um, uh, if um, applicants meet the initial criteria that I described earlier, you live and work in Washington, Orange County, earn less than 80% of the area median income, you have some reason why you need housing, um, and you're willing to partner with us, which is just an attestation, um, pretty easy application. Uh, then we go through a verification process where we verify your income and, um, and things like that. Uh, we, we might change our process a little bit uh, to make it easier for folks, but um, it's still in works. Okay. Um, so what are the, uh, so two main questions. What are the m misconceptions around um, poor people in housing and people with special needs if that group comes into play? Um, and then second, what are the future goals of Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity? Um, so I think, um, I, I don't know if I can address the, the question about misconceptions because I'm not really sure. I the think. Mis okay, so, you know, if you, let me see if I can, um, if you run into needing a, a house, but, um, like, if you can't afford it, but you need housing, is, is that a misconception? Like, uh, are there misconceptions around? Well, I think there's mis housing? there's misconceptions around homelessness um, yeah. that people think that uh, you I'm know. I'm sorry if I. No, no, that's uh, that's okay. So, um, you know, some people might assume. You know, I think the most visible populations of homelessness that we see are oftentimes uh, during the day on the street on the bike path. And that can create uh, a misconception about who our homeless populations are. And, um, and those people that we see visibly are usually a smaller percentage of the actual people that are unhoused, because most of our unhoused populations are working, or they're taking care of their family inside um, wherever they are right now. Um, and so there is not one reason for homelessness. Um, providing more housing is not going to solve the problem. It's also a mental health and a drug addiction problem. Um, it's, uh, you know, so we need more social services in addition to housing. There's, um, so there's, there's lots of reason why people are unhoused. Um, and in terms of, you know, uh, affordable housing, I think, again, when people think of affordable housing, they think of, um, 
you know, maybe it's uh, it's it's rental, it's, it's low income rentals where uh, you have uh, which are. You know, you don't have people living there necessarily for very long, um, or uh, it's transient by nature, or something like that. And there's, and as a result, there's less buy into the com the property and the community. And that's not always the case, um, but when we think of like the bad examples of uh, low income housing, you know, that's where people want to go. But um, you know, affordable housing is a broad spectrum, um, and there are lots of people. Most people really care and are grateful for for the support they get, um, both from rentals and from home ownership, um, and that they are fantastic, wonderful um, neighbors, um, and uh, and and actually having a diverse economic. Uh, diverse community um, of low, moderate, and high income um, creates a, a stronger and a better neighborhood. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's our sense anyways. Okay. Everybody benefits from it. future goals of uh, yeah, so we are currently building a duplex in Randolph as our first duplex, so going from single family to multifamily um, or multi-unit, and um, so that's pretty exciting. We're partnering with an organization called Bensonwood uh, to help build the exterior, to help us build faster, and so we, because uh, we are doing our part or trying to do our part to build houses more quickly to address the housing crisis. Um, uh, after that, we are planning to, the city of Barrie is selling us a property of land, property for one dollar, um, basically donating it to us and helping us with the cost of demolition and uh, so that we can build a new house, the uh, existing house is unstable. Um, and then we have a couple projects lined up um, uh, that I can't really speak too much about, but for the last couple of years we've been working on an architectural and engineering and feasibility study for a larger housing development on Northfield Street. Um, uh, it's uh, right now it's a conservation planned unit development so approximately 25 acres of the 50 acres a half would is planned to be conserved as a publicly accessible neighborhood park uh, 12 acres um, could be developed for um, anywhere between 100 and 200 units. Right now, we, we have a concept design that envisions, envisions 115 units uh, as a mixed unit, mixed income community uh, with uh, workforce housing, with single family and townhouses, senior housing, uh, transitional housing for seniors, um, and low income rentals, and um, affordable income sensitive home ownership opportunities that we would construct. Well, we would like to uh, thank you for <clears throat> joining me on this edition of Ableton on Air. Uh, for more information on Habitat for Humanity, where keep, can people turn to get help? They can, uh, for, yes, uh, people can call us at 802-522-8611. Uh, we will pick up if we are there and, uh, and glad to help you through our program or direct you in, in the right uh, place. What's the website? Uh, can go to. Our website is centralvermonthabitat.org, and that is all spelled out, centralvermonthabitat.org. Okay, for more information on Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, you can go to central, uh, www.centralvermonthabitat.org or 802, what is it? 522-8611. That number again is 802-522-8611. Uh, again, thank you to uh, Zachary Ralph Watson of Habitat for Humanity, and I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next edition of Able Then On It. Major sponsors for Able Then On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include 
Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abu Dananer has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.